So what is intelligence? Um, it is one of those concepts where it depends on who you ask. So originally people sort of agreed on it as our ability to discern true or important information from false or unimportant information. So if you are intelligent, you're able to sort of pick up stuff that's useful in your environment and hopefully make use of that in some logical way. That isn't necessarily gonna capture all facets of intelligence. And even having a definition here of our ability to solve novel problems and learn from experience, getting into a little bit more creative and flexible thinking, that's also something that not everyone will agree upon. So while these are presented as sort of parts of definitions or potential definitions, we're probably going to sort of reserve judgment on what we think of as our definition of intelligence. And again, I've hinted that our final definition will be, it depends. Um, so we'll look at all of those different variations. So we can see sometimes people will focus on things like pattern recognition. Can you recognize important patterns in information that's presented to you? That might be an indicator of intelligence or high cognitive functioning. Um, analogous transfer is basically that ability when we were looking at problem solving techniques, um, can we take sort of a situation and apply it to a different situation? Can we learn from experience and make use of it? Um, which kind of ties into that uh, learning from experience, solving novel problems, sometimes using experience, that would all fall under that. And then the reasoning, this would be that logical approach can you follow rules? Can you um, sort of learn different logical statements and apply them? Again, all of this ends up being very abstract because of that lack of agreement on what we should talk about in terms of intelligence. And a lot of it, I keep saying that sort of um, high cognitive functioning might be something more people could agree on, but again, we'll find that that's not necessarily capturing every facet of intelligence. And we might focus on flexibility, we might focus on acquired knowledge, we might focus on logic, um, and so on and so forth. And we'll add more and more to what could be considered intelligence as we work through all of the theories. And I think in this chapter, when even with our historical examples, starting with our base IQs, and then getting into some of the more complex ones, we're going to talk about at least five or six different theories and different measures of intelligence. And they are all going to have things that they are good at or not so good at. Um, and that's the stuff we're going to focus on the most. Starting with some of those early ideas on intelligence, as always with psychology and where do some of these ideas come from, we often end up going back to our Greek philosophers. So Aristotle had looked at sort of two dimensions of behavioral flexibility as it would relate to intelligence. Um, here, it wasn't called intelligence, it was called wisdom though. And so we have practical wisdom, which would be, are we able to make practical use of information? Can we apply knowledge? Can we use reasoning in a more real world setting? Um, then we have theoretical wisdom, which would be more of understanding objective truths, uh, more of their scientific logic, though at the time science wasn't quite what it is today, this is a lot more abstract rather than concrete. So our two distinctions here, practical being applied in practice, and theoretical is more that theory and logic, something a lot more um, in line with what our philosophers would have been focused on. Um, so you can kind of think of this as maybe working with your hands versus working with abstract thinking. Um, and this type of distinction is something that persists quite a while uh, or quite a long time. Um, it is even something you can think about today um, in terms of sort of uh, book smarts versus street smarts would be a good modern equivalent. Um, and you can find that some people are good at both or good at neither or one or the other. And that might indicate that they are maybe different facets of intelligence. Um, and again, these might pop up in some of our later theories just with different names or slightly different framings. But it's neat to see that an idea like this has persisted for an awfully long time. So we're going to have a massive jump forward where when we start looking at sort of more recent stuff, we're going to jump really far forward and we're going to drop back about 100 years once again. 
Um, but here, one of our big recent um, sort of reviews or meta-analyses of the field of intelligence research, this one was done in 96, um, but it was basically trying to look at intelligence publications, uh, existing theories, and different studies that had been looking at how can we measure intelligence, how can we quantify it. Um, and basically, they found a couple of similar themes um, focusing on intelligence as something that would allow us to adapt to changes, so flexibility, but also learn from experience, so acquiring hard knowledge from past encounters. And this is an idea that is going to end up named a bunch of different things, but this sort of duality of sort of being able to think on our feet, being able to adapt to changing environments, especially in the face of challenges that we've never encountered before, is one aspect of intelligence that a lot of people will agree on. But we also have more of a concrete buildup of knowledge based on experience, where the more stuff that you've encountered, the more base knowledge you have to pull from, and sometimes the better your solutions moving forward because of that experience. Now, this ties fantastically to the last portion of chapter nine, talking about our problem solving, where we had that discussion of, yes, experience can be really useful. You can say, these are the solutions that have worked in the past. They should be continuing to be useful in the future but we've lost some of the flexibility, so we might miss out on more efficient solutions. And I usually use the example of um, if you've ever gone into uh, an environment, like a work environment, where people are very set in how they do stuff. Um, I joined and worked with the federal government for a little while, and I can tell you that they had systems in place. There were lots and lots of spreadsheets, and I came in as a new student. I was still in an undergrad, and I was like, hey, did you know that you can set up spreadsheets to auto-calculate stuff? Did you know that you can point spreadsheets to other spreadsheets so you can auto-calculate across multiple places? And they had no idea. So they were set in their ways. They knew how to solve problems. They knew how to work with their separate spreadsheets and copy and paste stuff repeatedly. And it was like, hey, I have a new solution. I have no idea how to do what you've done for years, but my solution works too and might be more efficient. So I lacked experience, but I had flexibility. And we will find that that trade-off is actually something that we'll see um, changing in terms of intelligence with age and types of intelligence that we rely on with age. Um, so yeah, something important that comes up with many names. So as I said, we hopped way forward. We're gonna hop back a little bit back to the uh, 1800s. And this is where we have our famous figure for intelligence testing and the start of our standardized tests within psychology. Um, so we have Sir Francis Galton, and he's sometimes called sort of our father of psychometrics or um, basically tests in psychology where we're using standardized measures or standardized series of questions to boil it down to some kind of number or statistic that has meaning for us. So an intelligence uh, test is going to be a fantastic example of this. Um, I always state, though, that Francis Galton is one of those very problematic characters in history. So while we always end up discussing him because this is where we started our obsession with standardized tests, the reason for these tests is something that's a pretty dark time in history. Um, so crash course on this. Uh, we don't need all the details. Um, but basically, he was working in, I believe, France, and at the time, they were trying to find a way to sort of standardize an education system, but they were operating within a very biased society, and they wanted some kind of concrete measure that would allow them to separate highly educated individuals or smarter individuals from sort of the lay people. So basically, his tests were designed to go into schools to say, should this individual sort of qualify for higher education? Should they continue in school? Or are they scoring so low that it's not worth continuing their education? Let's go and send them off to more of a training situation so they'd be able to work in factories and do menial labor. And if we think about it, a lot of these kids, even though we're doing a standardized test across all of the country, 
Um, those kids that came from wealthy backgrounds probably would have had tutors from their families. They would have been taught how to read and do math and logic problems and things like that. So they were already given the information that would allow them to score high naturally on these tests. But um, Galton and others at this time looked at these standardized scores and said, oh, look, the aristocracy, uh, aristocracy scores high. Um, and therefore they are smarter and therefore they are better and they deserve sort of special schooling. And everybody else scores really low and therefore we can justify putting them into sort of labor situations. We can put these kids straight to work in a factory. There's no need to educate them because they're already so far behind. Um, so like I said, a very biased start to these standardized tests. Though it did get us started on the idea that maybe there's the potential for some uh, measure that would be useful in terms of determining intelligence. Um, and one of the justifications here, actually getting to the slide information, is a lot of the justification tied back to Darwin's theory of evolution, which unsurprisingly around this time had gained a lot of popularity in very biased applications. Again, focusing on hey, the upper class of society tends to perform better on these tasks and therefore they must be better people. So they've evolved and they are showing higher abilities and therefore they must be superior because evolution has made them the best of the best. And if we remember how evolution works and it's the survival of the fittest, um, that's not exactly how we should be applying it. So this led them to make a determination that mental ability is inherited because you had highly educated families, um, so they scored high and looked intelligent based on standardized tests, having kids that they then educated and then would score high on these tests, and you'd have uneducated families with uneducated children who would all score low, and they said, aha, within families we get agreement on these tests and therefore intelligence is genetic or inherited, runs within families, and therefore we have this reason why we can separate upper and lower classes. So they accidentally ended up actually stumbling into something that is still used today. So we still use standardized tests and we still have an understanding that actually, yeah, there is a genetic component to intelligence, which we'll get to talk about a little bit later, but there is also a massive contribution from environment. And education can be one of those contributions, but it definitely depends on the type of intelligence we're looking at, where if we wanted to look at base knowledge, yeah, education's gonna be really important. But if we wanted to look at flexibility and thinking, then maybe the education is not um, sort of the biggest contributor there, there might be something else. So all of that being disclaimers of, we started at a very biased point, and moved forward, but I can say for sure that even modern intelligence tests are going to have their own bias, and we have a section to discuss that as we move forward. So we came out of Galton's standardized testing, and we had a bunch of different iterations of this. There were lots and lots of people who were very interested in finding ways to quantify things like intelligence. Um, but our next important individuals are going to be Alfred Bennett and Theodore Simon. And I will say these are French uh, psychologists, so they were still in that mindset of tests of mental ability. Um, the French will also tell you that that is a poor pronunciation, but we're not trying it today. Um, they were into the first sort of standardized proper intelligence test that wasn't just designed to separate the classes. Here is where they were trying to actually quantify types of questions that should give us an indicator of mental ability. Um, and interestingly, they were trying to design these tests to quantify mental ability um, in terms of children's abilities to start and then into adults' abilities as time went on. Um, and we start seeing a little bit of a separation here between aptitude and achievement. And this is an important start to that separation between um, what it is that you already know versus what it is that you are capable of. So if we have an aptitude test, that's gonna be a lot more about what is your potential moving forward. 
So in a lot of cases, modern IQ tests are usually trying to understand things like um, how is your cognitive flexibility in general? So we have some tests and they're gonna test a bunch of different areas where you can show this flexibility and we can make some determinations about how you'd handle and encounter new things in the future. So high flexibility means you should be pretty flexible and good at problem solving in a bunch of other ways. So that would be more of a judgment of aptitude. Um, or I've talked before, a standardized test is the GRE for getting into grad school. If we're trying to quantify sort of how you should do as a graduate student, we could frame it as an aptitude test because we're trying to judge future ability. However, we end up finding that some of these, even if we're trying to get aptitude, especially with something like the GRE, they often end up getting a good measure of achievement. So first off, what is an achievement test going to do in contrast? This is more about knowledge that you have acquired or skills that you have acquired. What is it that you have currently achieved? Where have you gotten to? So if a test is testing your base knowledge, then it's more of an achievement test. Um, even something like we do driving tests. That is, how good are your driving skills presently? What have you achieved so far? If we had a test of, say, reflexes, and we would use that as a judgment of how well you would do as a driver in the future, that would be more of an aptitude looking at that potential. So we separate the two on um, kind of forward facing versus backward facing. Um, and in this case, having that distinction, we're now not so tied into the idea of, well, if you've been in a good school, you've acquired more knowledge and therefore you are smarter, you are more intelligent, now we also have that potential for more cognitive flexibility rather than just experience. Um, so the starting point for some of the more modern approaches. So what are some of our important terms here? We're getting into our next figure. Um, I will say we're very name heavy here, but as per usual, I don't really test where I need you to know the names. I might mention that Bennett was one of our early figures in intelligence testing. Um, and what could we say of one of the measures proposed by them? Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say something like, which of the following proposals came from Bennett? That's not super useful. So names, if they help you, great. If not, you can skip them just like I do. Um, but this one, William Stern, if it helps, um, came up with the concept of mental age. And this is when we're starting to standardize, not just across sort of everybody, but with children especially, looking at um, what should someone of this age be capable of and where does the individual that we're measuring fall in relation to where we'd expect them to be. So if you have a higher mental age than your actual age, your physical age, then you have a score that is higher than 100. Um, and this is where we start seeing our IQ scores, which always have an average of 100, um, though we'll sort of, again, move into that. So they've mentioned sort of two terms here, ratio IQ versus deviation IQ. Um, I don't care too much about this distinction. I think the text goes into it, but we really just care about the fact that we're looking at a comparison between your mental age, so um, how you perform, versus your actual physical age. So if we were looking at five-year-olds, we'd say, okay, five-year-olds should be able to do these kinds of word problems, and they should be able to do these kinds of uh, matching words to pictures, and they should be able to, uh, say, recite this many words in a list or something like that. Um, and if you have a child who can do more than that, then their score would be higher than average. And if, because of how they've designed this equation, our average is going to be 100, if your mental age is higher than your physical age, your score is higher than 100. If we have the opposite, if there are certain standards that your age group should be capable of reaching and you are incapable of doing some of those tasks, then your mental age is going to be lower than your physical age and then your IQ score is going to be lower than 100. So if you are performing on par for people your age, then you have a score of 100. 
If you are performing better, it's above. If you are performing worse, it is below. And this rule with that 100 as the average and higher versus lower for better or worse than average, that actually holds even into a modern day IQ test. But again, this is where we started and they've been changing the questions and changing their methods of standardization as time goes on. And you can take entire courses on psychometrics where you delve into this a heck of a lot more, but as per usual, we're just talking about the logic here rather than the actual calculation. Um, all right, so how did we move forward from here? Some of our revisions into the future, we have Lewis Terman who revised some of Bennett's original tests. So this shows us that Bennett's legacy actually ended up sort of moving into the future and is carried for decades and decades to the point that the Stanford Bennett test or a variation, later editions of it, is actually still in use today. But it's been revised and sort of focused on at different points in history. Specifically, one of the times it was especially relied on was actually during World War I. And in this case, in the US, during World War I, they needed some kind of standard to determine if someone was capable of being in the military. So they wanted to have sort of a cutoff where if you scored below a certain value, we really don't want to bother training you up because it's probably not going to go well. So you have to score somewhere above a certain IQ in order to qualify. Though as they started doing this, they actually ran into some issues where not everyone was capable of taking the test in the methods that it was delivered. So during World War I, not everyone they wanted in the army was capable of reading and writing. So they had to modify the test where they could take it verbally rather than in a written format. Um, they also did some where maybe they worked more with symbols, which is something that gets more and more important as time goes on, um, even to account for things like language differences. So trying to find a way to test for intelligence to try and get as many people as possible to qualify when they had these rules on who could or could not be recruited. Because of course they want as many people as possible. So that's one of the uses there. Um, now, one of the things to note here is our Stanford Bennett tests are going to match what we typically conceptualize when thinking about IQ tests. So in these cases, we're going to get a single IQ score at the end. So we're going to get a number where an average individual in the population is going to score 100. If you are above average, you score above 100. Below average is below 100. And with the way that they designed these questions, you should find a fairly normal distribution, which we're gonna remember from our methods chapter where we talked about at least the fact that it is a symmetrical distribution. There are more specific standardizations, but again, beyond our scope. We also have another test that sort of became a standard, something that came up as sort of something a little bit different. Um, and in this case, we're gonna talk about our Weschler tests where we have a series of subtests. So instead of just focusing on a single score, though they did boil the individual subtest scores down to a single number so they could compare it to other standards, um, but they had other subtests where we'd get into sort of verbal components and written components and performance components, trying to test more aspects of intelligence. So here we have two standards, once again, that are still very commonly in use, though having been revised fairly repeatedly across time. Uh, and these are going to be our Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale and Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children. So if you've heard of the WACE and WASC, um, if you've done any kind of research in sort of developmental research, oftentimes we'll use these measures. Um, this is fairly common. Uh, there are also some variations, so for preschool and primary school, so this would be very young children because the intelligence scale for children doesn't quite apply at certain ages, um, but all of these are going to have sort of different spans in, under which they apply. Um, most of our modern approaches, when we think of a standard IQ test, we can only really use the standard for adults. Um, as we start looking at children, there are differences uh, based on sort of development, and we'd have to have things for specific age groups. So it gets more complicated at that point. 
So I will say that the questions I'm remembering when I ask about IQ tests, I usually specify that we're talking about adults. So that's going to be our assumption because that's what we have the most data on. So all of that, very vague, just talking about the fact that we're going to somehow get a measure through a bunch of standardized questions where we're going to have an average individual is going to score 100. So you can imagine that if we were designing these uh, standardized tests, we'd have to pick individual questions. We'd have to sort of test them on a standard or a sample to try and figure out what do people tend to score. And then looking at those tendencies, can we standardize the data? Can we boil it down? Can we adjust it so that it fits a normal distribution, but with an average of 100? So they're going to be making these modifications. Sometimes they adjust questions. Sometimes they adjust how you calculate your single output at the end based on the responses to those questions. It's usually an ongoing process. So we're going to talk about the fact that even if we were, say, designing a new IQ test, um, we're trying to carry out an IQ test in a new population. If we're doing it properly, we're actually going to standardize and set our average to, uh, to 100 um, because that's how you design one of the IQ tests. And again, we'll have some exceptions coming up. Um, but if we wanted to actually look at these measures, we have a single number that's been output as our IQ score. What does that actually mean? Is it useful? Can we make any determinations with that? Um, of course, people have tried to do correlation studies to see, well, people who score high on IQ tests, what else do they tend to do? So we'll usually find that high IQ individuals tend also to do better in academic settings. So they tend to get better grades or get a higher education. So they'd be more likely to get multiple university degrees um, rather than, say, stopping in high school. Um, they also tend to do better in terms of occupational status and job performance. So they get higher paying jobs. They get higher ranked jobs within their companies. They tend to be more respected within those positions. So that ties to income. And then we also see health and longevity. So the more intelligent you are, you tend to be in better health and you tend to live longer. And so all of this is saying, well, if you score low on an IQ test, you've kind of got the short end of the stick. This seems really awful, but we've already talked about the fact that old IQ tests were biased. And I did hint about the fact that even modern ones are still going to be biased. So if we think about it, if some of our IQ tests are capturing not just aptitude, not just potential and flexible thinking, but can also be influenced by how we have been taught. So having high schooling might give us more of that cognitive problem solving ability. So then academic performance and sort of uh, distance you've gone within academia would correlate with intelligence testing because it might actually influence your IQ score because more education in more areas might help you perform better. So it's not necessarily that having a high IQ allows you to go further. The two might be interrelated. Uh, we then also see things like, well, if you have more degrees, if you have sort of more credentials, you're also then more likely to qualify for more jobs and to get better positions. And if you're in a higher position, you tend to get paid more. There's also the fact that if you start from a higher socioeconomic status, you have money available to you. You probably went to a better school, had more potential to continue on in university and maybe had more connections to get a better job after graduating. So all of these things end up conflated with a whole bunch of other variables. And in a lot of cases, if you start looking at things like socioeconomic status, a lot of these strong correlations for a lot of our core psychological principles um, are not necessarily as strong as they would be presented in some of the studies. So we always take a moment to talk about this saying, well, yes, these tend to correlate, but there is absolutely something else going on here because it isn't just that being smart guarantees that you're going to get a good job. There's so much more to it than that. So I always point that out because you can look at some of these correlations. So this one here is looking at uh, within a family. So they actually do help uh, control for things like starting socioeconomic status. But if we look at siblings who have a lower IQ versus higher IQ, 
um, we do see that there is a difference in sort of average earning. Um, so in those cases, we're like, okay, this is a little bit more trustworthy than just saying blanket low IQ versus high IQ. We've controlled for socioeconomic status from your start point. But again, still you have, maybe if you've had more education, maybe you showed more promise in school and your teachers gave you more attention. And maybe you were in advanced classes, which allowed you to get further ahead in your university and so on. Those are also things to consider. So we can see these patterns and we can say they've done a good job of some stuff, but they can also be presented in a more dramatic way that might not be super representative. Um, this is another interesting one where they've looked at IQ and happiness, where they're saying, well, in countries, if they have a, an average high IQ, they tend also to have a higher average happiness. But can we think of some third variables? I'm sure we can. Um, maybe higher ha or nations that are more happy, maybe it's because they have more of a stable economy. And if you have a stable economy, you probably have a better education system. And we've already mentioned that education and IQ can end up being overlapped because some of the tests are going to still be testing um, achievement rather than just aptitude. So in this case, we're gonna say possibly, however. Um, and when I look at this graph, I always remember, because I teach a methods course as well, um, there's also a very high correlation between nation's happiness and uh, amount of cheese consumed per capita. Um, which seems really weird. So cheese makes people happy, or happy people love cheese, or happier countries tend to be more stable and have more money and would therefore have better access to foods um, that are not necessarily, say, grown by the people themselves, but would be available through, say, grocery stores and things like that. So in those cases, there are many, many other variables that can be involved. And this is why I do mention, if you wanna go searching for weird correlations, there are tons um, and I absolutely love them. So that's another one, happiness and cheese correlate positively around the world.